Um, but this, we, we are basically bringing you all together today um, as the CGIR, the center, um, which includes ILRI, International Livestock Research Institute, where we are sitting here in Nairobi, um, International Food Policy Research Institute, where I am based, and um, the Institute, International Institute of Tropical Agriculture, which has done a lot of work on, on aflatoxin and developing aflasafe over the past years. So a warm welcome. Thank you to our remote participants for joining as well. I hope that um, I hope the connection is good and just let me know if it is not. I'm going to start recording this so that people can watch it later as well. Okay. Trying to proceed. Okay. So the goals for today are, first of all, um, well, let me introduce myself. I'm Vivian Hoffman. I'm at the uh, International uh, Food Policy Research Institute based here in Nairobi. And we called this seminar today with two main goals. First of all, the CGIAR, so IFPRI, ILRI, and IITA, IITA have all been doing a lot of research over the past few years on aflatoxin. How big of a problem is it? How can we control it? How can markets help us do that? How can other instruments help us control aflatoxin? And so we wanted to bring together some of those results, um, present them to you, and also discuss with, with all of you what are the best ways forward for actually working to control aflatoxin um, in Kenya and in Ghana. So Basically, the role of aflatoxin in, in Africa generally and, and in much of the world is if you look for it, you will find it. So this graph shows you results um, taken from a number of studies and a number of different commodities. And as you can see, this is all from Kenya. Um, I'll show a Ghana in a moment. So whenever people have tested for aflatoxin, it has been there. Right? The most highly contaminated crops are generally maize and groundnut. Not a lot of groundnut studies have been done in Kenya, so those aren't here. But there's a ton of studies on maize for human consumption, and also maize used for animal feed, where it's even higher. We see lower levels of aflatoxin in sorghum, and some studies have shown that it's about a quarter of as, as high on average in sorghum as it is in maize. So in aflatoxin, high aflatoxin areas, that can be a good alternative crop. Other staples like millet or root vegetables can also be good for those regions. Um, and a lot of studies, so, so this is the legal limit in Kenya now, 10 parts per billion. And in many cases, um, the, even the average is higher than that, right? So these, um, these orange tri uh, diamonds are the proportion of samples that are out of conformance. So those are above the threshold on this axis. So in some cases, you have over 80% are, are non-compliant. In some cases, you have 70% non-compliant, even in human food. Um, the threshold for milk is far lower, and the levels in milk are far lower. So the reason the threshold is lower in milk is because milk is, is often relied on as a weaning food for infants, and aflatoxin can be especially bad for infants. Um, but we do see much lower levels in milk, even though the feed is high because the, the level is reduced when it is processed through, through an animal, basically. I don't know why this isn't advancing, sorry. Okay. In Ghana, we have much the same story. So you can find aflatoxin in stored maize, and here's the legal limit in Ghana, 10 parts per billion as well, um, in stored maize and really high levels in stored ground nut. Okay, um, it just it, there's a lot of variation over time and space. So you just see those high levels occasionally. That doesn't mean that it's always this high in this particular region, but you do see very high levels. So why worry about aflatoxin? Well, number one, we know that it causes liver cancer. We also know that the cancer effect is amplified when people are carriers of hepatitis B. In fact, it's 30 times greater, right? So just to put, put out at the outset, we're here to talk about aflatoxin control, but another really important strategy is using the hepatitis B vaccine. So all infants should be vaccinated. It's on the recommended schedule of vaccinations, um, and older individuals can also get the vaccine. Secondly, high levels can be fatal. 
So over 300 fatalities have been reported in Eastern Kenya. Um, there have been fatalities elsewhere in the world, basically in aflatoxin hotspots. Aflatoxin may also interfere with child growth. There's a lot of studies showing an association between exposure and growth and some experimental evidence, but not yet conclusive, showing that, that there is an impact on child stunting. These more studies are ongoing. And finally, aflatoxin can be a barrier to trade. So it's just one of several barriers. Low productivity is also a major barrier, but especially in Western Africa, where they used to have a lot of out exports of groundnut to Europe, those have fallen down and there's a lot of rejections due to aflatoxin. So we have this problem. We can see it has implications. We can see it has some trade implications. What should, what should we prioritize when we want to control aflatoxin? Well, first of all, as I showed previously, the highest levels are in maize and groundnut. And especially when those crops are eaten as staples, especially maize is eaten, a huge proportion of calories come from maize, especially for poorer people, this should be a priority. Secondly, farmers in high aflatoxin areas. So there are parts of Kenya, definitely, where aflatoxin is a much bigger problem than other parts. I think there's not as much research yet in Ghana about the really high aflatoxin areas, although there is some research coming out. Um, but those are the areas where people actually can die from aflatoxin poisoning because the levels get so high. And that's where we need to prioritize public health action. Um, those are the places where it's, people are most exposed. And the farmers themselves who store maize under bad conditions are the ones who end up dying from aflatoxin poisoning. And not only that, they're the ones who are getting the most cancer risk because they're chronically exposed as well. And then finally, because infants have high sensitivity to any foodborne hazard, and aflatoxin may in particular cause growth problems with infants, we need to worry about infant foods. And we see some really high levels in infant foods. So this is a study um, from Ghana that shows in processed foods, processed groundnut foods, levels can be very high. Now the reason for that is that when you have groundnut, you can actually visually sort pretty effectively. The nice looking nuts are much less contaminated than the really bad looking ones. And what do you do with the good nuts? You sell them whole. And what do you do with the bad nuts? You process them. And so the processed foods end up having higher levels. And we see that across these different types of processed um, groundnut foods. But most worryingly, we see that a lot in infant foods. So these are foods that are promoted as weaning foods. And when infants are consuming this much aflatoxin, it's definitely not good for them. Okay, so I just wanted to give that quick overview of what, you know, why do we care about aflatoxin? I think everybody knows what aflatoxin is. It's a contaminant that comes from a fungus found in the soil. So I, I didn't start at the very beginning. Um, but for the rest of today's program, I first want to invite um, our speakers from Kenya, Kenya and Ghana to talk about um, aflatoxin policy in each of their respective countries. So Kenya has much more experience, I think, developing an Afri aflatoxin control policy. Um, so Robert Colonzo from the Ministry of Health will give us an overview there. And then, um, and then Ghana is just now starting to develop a national policy and te technical regulation. So we'll have a presentation on that. After these, we'll talk about pre-harvest solutions, in particular Aflasafe, a product developed by IITA from both Kenya and Ghana. Then we'll talk about post-harvest solutions and a comparison of cost effectiveness of different types of solutions and farmer adoption um, and how we can catalyze farmer adoption through subsidies and market incentives. We'll take a short tea break and then um, we'll have a presentation from Ilri Delia Grace about binders for aflatoxin control in, in livestock production. Um, and Moving on to consumer demand, how can actually markets drive aflatoxin? How can markets be driven to provide safer food? And then finally, we'll discuss how to build capacity for better testing and regulation of aflatoxin. So we'll have a pre presentation from Aptika, um, and then we'll close, and the Ghana team will get to have lunch. So we'll try to keep on time. Uh, apologize for the late start. But with that, can I hand it over to... Mr. Colonzo.